But let's, uh, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, again, another opportunity to be able to come together, to open up your word, to study it, to learn more about you, and to learn more about the grace that you have freely given to us and how we come to that and lay hold of that through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for him and everything that he stands for and his redemptive power and his taking away our sins and taking them and putting them on himself. We ask that as we study this morning, we can fully appreciate that and hope it to, hope that it creates in us a, a new fervent desire to long to serve after you and to be confident in exactly what has been done for us. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so uh, on Wednesday night, um, Ben covered uh, Romans chapter 4 for us. And to start off that discussion, he said, and I quote, because we can do that now, I can go back and watch the video, video evidence. He said of chapter 4, it's one of the most straightforward chapters of Romans, I would say. So there should be no hiccups tonight. It should be smooth sailing, end quote. And then this morning, we're supposed to cover Romans chapter 5 in its, in its entirety. And uh, unfortunately, and I, I genuinely mean unfortunately, because... I, while the overall point that Paul is trying to make here in, in Romans chapter 5 uh, really is extremely simple and straightforward, the chapter has been morphed uh, into something that is not very straightforward and can really, as opposed to being smooth sailing, can lead into some, some rough and, and choppy waters. Uh, and really, if you look at the chapter and you read it as a whole, that's, that's not without cause. Uh, if you read chapter 5 in a vacuum, specifically we're talking about verses 12 through uh, 21, you would probably come away with some questions uh, about the nature of, of God and the nature of man's sinfulness and the relation of the two. And if you don't come away with those questions, then you probably should read it again. I don't know how, how close of a attention you were paying. Um, but in preparing to talk about this chapter this morning, uh, I thought about and, and prayed a lot about the best way to do it, especially given this setting with the, the auditorium setting, the fact that there's a lot of people at home watching. We've got a, a wide and diverse group. Um, and the same can be said really since learning that we were teaching, uh, or teaching Romans, and now I'm teaching it with two preachers, uh, and the fact that uh, I really want to do the text justice, I want to do Paul's gospel justice, I want to do Christ crucified justice, and I really want to do us as, as Bible students, both you and me, justice as we uh, look at these particular uh, texts. So I went back and, and I referenced some of my old notes because I have taught Romans uh, chapter 5 before, and I couldn't help but feel in the past that I used words that uh, ended in ology or ism too many times to really be helpful uh, to anyone. Uh, so in preface, I'm, I'm going to try and not do that this morning. Uh, but this is still a class. We're here to, to attempt to learn. So I don't want to dance around it. What I'm talking about, for those of you who uh, may be less familiar overall with um, the Bible in general or Romans uh, specifically, there are several uh, specific verses within chapter 5 that are kind of bulwark passages for uh, doctrines of what's commonly called original sin or inherited sin, and then an idea called universalism. And I cannot overstate this, but the intent of this particular chapter in, in Romans, if you can believe it, is not to introduce and expound upon these particular ideas, these particular theologies at all. But I can at least understand why those ideas do come up here. Uh, and but I just want to, you know, kind of reiterate the point that it is a, it is a sidewalk on a back road off of the exit ramp of the highway that Paul is attempting to drive us down here in, in Romans chapter 5. So to kind of kick off, to really lead into our discussion uh, this morning, what I want to do is go back and 
look at uh, how we got to this point, how we got to where we're at in, in Romans chapter 5, some of the claims that Paul has made, and even how Paul has made those claims, because I think that will uh, add to the, the structure of chapter 5 as we get into it. So, first off, in, in Romans chapter 1, right after the introduction, Paul dives into the wrath of God uh, being poured out on the unrighteous. And specifically, in, in the end of chapter 1, he's talking about the Gentiles there who were, we recall, we, they were willfully suppressing uh, their knowledge of God, and then instead were, were building themselves up uh, to be God really in his place. And despite not having a, a written law or a written code uh, as such, they all knew what they were doing was wrong and that it was deserving of death, but still they did it anyway. They continued to lean into that. They continued to do that. And I was talking with, uh, with Josh Lankford. I don't I don't see him right now, but I was talking with Josh Langford uh, after one of the classes here recently, and uh, he said something I've been thinking about too a lot, that if, you, if you, any of you like to read C.S. Lewis uh, and one of his uh, books called Mere Christianity, it's one of, his, one of his very popular works, but the first section of that, that work is uh, essentially Romans chapter 1 and 2 in C.S. Lewis's uh, own language. But in summary, the point is, don't act like you don't know who God is. Don't act like you're not accountable to what he would ultimately want from you because you do know. I can, I can look at you. I can observe the way that you behave. I can listen to the things that you say. I can appreciate the arguments that you make. And I can tell that you know. And if you're honest with yourself, it would become evident to you as well. And in that first section in Romans, it's interesting at least with this particular mold that I'm trying to, to make for us this morning, that he doesn't quote from any specific scripture in, in, in Romans chapter 1 in that particular section, at least not like he'll do uh, as he moves into chapter 2. But that makes sense in context because in Romans chapter 1, like I said, he's, he's dealing with the Gentiles and he's trying to, to prove that they are due uh, condemnation even without a, a piece of paper to point out or even without stone tablets to point out and say this, this is why. But then beginning in chapter 2, he seemingly turns his attention over to the Jewish audience, if you'll recall. And he's trying to condemn them and therefore to corral all men, right, lead all men, funnel all men to the same conclusion that all are sinners. Uh, but the Jew might object to that. But they might say, you know, what about my, my moral position of authority? What about my possession of the oracles of God, of the law of God? What about my circumcision? What about my advantage, right? And first he uses logic and understanding to say, no, really, you are sinners, and you are in the exact same boat as those Gentiles that you can, yourselves condemn. They miss the mark, and you miss the mark, and there are no amount of works that can get you closer to that mark. If you think about it, we've, we've talked about this before, but sin is an, is an archery term. If any of you have ever shot a bow, there is no correcting it once that arrow is, is gone, right? It, 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 there's no amount of reshooting that can take that first arrow and put it back on the mark that it was supposed to hit. It's gone, it's, it's away, and it's, it's missed, right? And so no amount of works can put us back uh, on, that, on that path. We are, we are not righteous, we are not as we should be, as we've looked at the definition of that word, based on works and, or in the, based on our works in relation to a law-keeping statute. And the Jews, specifically, your Jewishness, Jewishness is... Jewishness, is not a get-out-of-jail-free card in relation to that, to that concept, all right? So you are just in the same boat uh, that they are, and that's always been the case. But then after he does that, he proves his point and gives an example by turning right to Scripture, right? Something that they should know all too well. And in that particular uh, section, and this is towards the end of, of chapter, or the middle of chapter 3 now, where he's condemning the Jewish people and saying, no, you really are guilty of sin, Let's look, let's look at Scripture to prove it. And he quotes several passages from the Psalms and, and Isaiah to prove that the Jew is, in fact, um, guilty of sin, guilty of being unrighteous. And there's the undercurrent, if you'll recall, when we talked about this in those particular passages of the idea of a saving faith uh, all along. And then he hits the crux of the matter, and he lays out the model by which we are justified, and that is the model of, of grace through faith in Jesus. 
It has nothing to do with our works because works by their very nature go hand in hand with uh, wages, you know, and, and earning something. Uh, and grace, uh, by contrast, is, is a gift. And so you can even hear, while Paul is explaining that, you can hear the objection of the Jew, or maybe even a Gentile perhaps, who says something like, uh, like the rich young ruler says uh, in, in Matthew chapter 19 or in Mark chapter 10. What did the rich young ruler come to the master and say? He has a question for him. The rich young ruler. Yeah, it says, good teacher, what good thing am I supposed to do to inherit eternal life? What, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to get it? How am I supposed to obtain it myself? So that's the objection that, that any person might have when Paul is laying out this idea of, of grace. What do, I have to, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get it? What good work do I have to do? Paul says, no, it is not works. It is by faith. And that's what he does here again in chapter 4. He turns to Scripture, just like he did in chapter 3, to prove his point. And he uses an example, an Old Testament and scriptural example of two people. Who are those two people? Abraham is one of them. Who is the other? Yeah, David, King David. All right, so he goes, that's, that's the cream of the crop from a, a Jewish standpoint, right? I mean, they're in the Hall of Fame from a Jewish perspective. These are, the, these are all stars. Uh, well, with Abraham, he says, let's look at the text. What does it specifically say about Abraham? That he, what? What did he do to... What did he do to obtain that righteousness? Yeah, it was faith, right? He believed in God and that was accounted to him for righteousness. So he's using scripture to prove his point. He's already said that. Here's the scripture to back it up. All right. And if that's not enough for you, let's talk about David. And then he quotes from, uh, from the Psalms where he says, uh, in verse seven, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So the king, right? King David here is acknowledging sin, acknowledging uh, the fact that his track record is not what makes him able to stand as righteous before God. It is solely a work of God because God is the one who is not going to impute uh, that sin to me, not going to account that sin to me. It's not my own track record that gets me out of it. It has to be as Paul said in Romans, a righteousness from God or a righteousness of God. And so then you come here to chapter five. And again, you see a similar structure, okay? Uh, Paul makes his point, And the, the, the point is that we can have full assurance and full confidence in the all-sufficiency in what Christ has done for us. And he states that in verses one through 11. And then he uses an Old Testament example a scriptural example to, to prove his point, to lay out uh, some backing for his point. And he uses Adam as an example of the, the law works way and the subsequent death that it leads to. Uh, and then he contrasts that with Christ's act, which is a much more than, right? It is a bigger deal than what uh, Adam has done. So no matter, no matter how big sin was, no matter how important and crucial the fall was, uh, what Christ did was more than capable, more than able to deal with it, to handle it, and you can trust in that, and you can hope in that, all right? That's the point of, of, of chapter 5. So I'll offer all that up as an introduction, not only to, uh, to reassess where we're at in the letter and, and how we got here, because it is a case, and we, need, we can't lose sight of this. Paul's letter to the Romans is a case that builds on itself. Every little thing stacks on top of the, the, the previous little thing. Uh, but specifically with chapter five here in mind, I want to say to you that we don't have to go overboard and read too much into what Paul is saying about Adam and what Paul is saying about sin, because that is an example, right? He's done this before. He gives us, he gives his thesis. He gives his statement. He gives his point. Old Testament example. He gives his thesis, he gives his statement, he gives his point. Old Testament example. Chapter 5, he gives his thesis, he gives his statement, he gives his point. Old Testament example, right? It starts off as just that, just uh, an example. Does that 
kind of makes sense what we're trying to, trying to structure here for us. Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, no, it's it is a it is a faith to obedience, right? And so, and we'll we'll talk about that obviously when we get to our to our next chapter. Um, and then you know, it's, but it's interesting even even in that using Abraham as an example because there are several times within the New Testament that Abraham is used as an example of faith, and a lot of them are at diff, very different points in in his life, right? Whenever, uh, for those of you who are not to take Ben's uh, steam away, but he's talking about Hebrews chapter eleven in his sermon, if you. I got the I got the, uh, the the precursor to that, um, but at the beginning of Hebrews, when Abraham is first mentioned as an example of faith, it's right at the beginning that he believes God. Right, you know that's chapter twelve, verse one. He, God called, he believed, and he went. Right, but he believed, and because of that belief, he went. All right, and then uh, it, it, the, the passage that you, uh, Paul uses here in Romans chapter uh, four is in Genesis chapter fifteen. Right. That's after he went to Egypt. That's after he tripped up and and you know fell fell down there. But he continually is moving forward. Right. His faith causes him to to move forward at all times. He falls, but he falls forward, and God keeps pulling him forward. Ultimately, because of that faith. Then in James, when he's referenced again, that's much 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 later in his life. Right. Uh, and that's with with Isaac uh, and and his faith and his willingness to do what God had called him to do because of his belief. So it is a faith to obedience. Yeah, those, those aren't uh, in contrast to one another. I think the point is that obedience driven by faith is different from works in the sense that I'm going to go out and I'm going to earn it, right? Because that's, that's something that creeps into all of our lives, and I think pretty easily and understandably so. Um, you know, we were, we just came out of the Christmas season, and one of my favorite Christmas movies is Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. That's a great film, right? And there's a point in that movie when uh, Kevin, you know, who's the main, the main character, and he's, he's talking with the pigeon lady. And I'm sorry if you don't know this. This is going to sound absurd if you don't know the movie. Uh, but, you know, he's talking with the pigeon lady, and he's all upset that things are the way they are and how that he's got into this particular position. And she says, well, you know, uh, a good deed you know, over, over accounts for a bad deed. And it's Christmas Eve, so... Good deeds count extra, you know, right now. And so you can make up for all those bad deeds with all the good ones. And he's like, well, I don't know if I have enough time. And that's when she says, well, it's Christmas Eve. You know, we've got, it, it, you get extra points now. But from a work standpoint to the, to the law, that is not how it works. Not even close, right? There is no good enough or plethora of points that you can put in your column to account for the bad ones. It is a binary thing. It is yes, no, black, white, one, zero. We shot that arrow and we missed, right? We can't get back on that path through works. It has to be faith. But to Tyler's point, that faith is one that can be evidenced by how we live our lives. And we'll, we'll see that, obviously, as we, we continue out through the rest of Romans. Um, okay. So let's read the first uh, five verses here uh, of Romans. Chapter five. Therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have all through through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Okay, so again, to reiterate, what are we justified by? 
faith. All right, it is, it is grace that is laid hold of through faith. And what is that faith in? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's by faith, and again, that means that it's not by our works, thank God. The reality of the situation is then that it's out of our hands, right? That we are having to put our hope, put our faith, put our trust in something that is outside of us. And can that be an unnerving thing? Is there anything that's a little, a little scary about that when you're just saying, I, I'm supposed to just give it all up. I'm supposed to just let go and put my faith and my trust completely in someone else, completely something that's outside of me. I mean, in, in other aspects of our life, um, are we not ty- the types of people that just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? If something's going to get done and it's going to get done right, I'm going to be the one that does it. I'm going to be the one that sets it the way it's supposed to be. Right, we're we're Americans. We're 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 we get down in the in the dirt and, and do it and do it right, or at least at least we used to be. And then the Jews, which you could be referencing specifically here, for millennia, have literally walked around with the law of God on their foreheads. I mean, that's something they still do. So it could even be more unnerving if our circumstances might seem to indicate that it isn't going so well. That it's, it's, things aren't supposed, or aren't apparently as they're supposed to be. You know, are my physical circumstances, my, my tribulations, uh, and that word can literally uh, mean the, the pressures of life. It was a word, if you've ever been up to, uh, to Boston and you've made a side trip over to Salem, and you talk about the witch trials, and one of the things they used to do was stack stones upon people, you know? I mean, until you confess. You know, stone, are you going to confess? No. Heavier stone, are you going to confess? No. Heavier stone. And that's literally the pressures. It's the same Greek word that's used here. The pressures of life are these tribulations, these tough circumstances, these afflictions, these distressing situations that you're experiencing. Are they actually telling me that, that maybe I'm not good enough yet? Maybe uh, it's an indication that I've, I've, I've done something wrong and that God has actually abandoned me because of that. Maybe, maybe this whole faith thing was actually a, a bad idea to begin with. Maybe, those, maybe Paul is, is just wrong. Maybe those other teachers actually have the right of it that are saying he's, he's not correct in preaching what he's preaching in this justification by faith. You know, maybe God doesn't care about me anymore. Maybe the last thing that I did was that final straw, and now I've got to try to work this out and get things back on track myself. I've got to work myself out of this hole. But is that the emotional or the psychological response that we are supposed to have when we are justified by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that how we're supposed to feel? What are we supposed to have? Sure. Yeah, we continue to, to press on, and, and Gene was saying how Paul is a exemplary example of that and how, how to, to continue to press on and continue to work. But are we supposed to, I guess my question is, are we supposed to live in fear now that we have and comprehend this faith that we have through Christ and what he's done? Yeah, what does he say here? We have peace with God. 
It is supposed to be a, a faith and an understanding that now we have, we have peace uh, with God. And it's a peace that makes us rejoice and it rejoice in, in hope. And it's the hope that we currently now have and futurely will stand before God as righteous because of the glorious actions of Christ and, and his resurrection. Jim McWiggin is, is one of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, writers, especially on these particular topics. He says, so if one has hope, they don't fearfully wait the judgment. They joyfully expect salvation, right? We joyfully wait our salvation. We don't fearfully sit around and wonder, am I good enough? Am I, am I as I should be? It is, it is that faith. And um, who, ha- who has this hope? Is it every single person without condition? It is the, and, and to the point here, Paul says, the, the standing believer, right? It is those who by grace are standing. It is not the, the unbeliever. It is not the, the person who is trusting in their own moral performance. Uh, it is not the lounging uh, indolent. It is the one who by faith stands in grace. And not only that, he says, but what is supposed to, to be produced when things aren't outwardly or, or inwardly, I suppose, for that matter, when things aren't so grace or great? It's supposed to be supposed to have this peace and this hope, but not, all, not just that, but what else? Patience, right? Patience that does what? Patience that can endure, right? And we're able to, to stand firm and that it produces, those tribulations produce perseverance. This is verse three. And that perseverance produces character and that character produces more hope, <laughs> right? That's where we're starting and we end up with more hope when we understand the, and, and appreciate the trials and the tribulations that, that we are uh, going through. Um, for the believer, this is comforting and gives us that peace because we can at least appreciate and understand that there is a purpose behind our sufferings. It's not just suffering for the sake of suffering, because that truly would be uh, unbearable. Uh, But Paul says, I have a hope that does not disappoint, right? It does not disappoint. It's interesting, disappoint there is the same Greek word that Paul used back in chapter 1, verse 16, when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not disappointed in the gospel of Christ, you could, you could translate it as. Um, and if you look at, at, at Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the, the context, the thing he just said before, I'm not ashamed or I'm not disappointed in the gospel of Christ, was laying out the circumstances that he was in. He's like, I know things haven't gone the way that I thought they would or thought they should. Uh, I've been hindered from coming to see you. Uh, I want to preach the, to you. I want to have fruit among you who are in Rome also. But am I disappointed in the gospel of Christ? Not even close, because it is the power of God to salvation. It is the righteousness of God revealed. And then he says here in in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 5, that we've been given the abiding gift of the Holy Spirit uh, through God's love. And that is a a seal of sonship, Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 6 tells us. And it's a it is a guarantee of of our, of our uh, state of being an heir or in our inheritance. And we'll talk more about that when we get to, to chapter 8. Um, but looking here now into verse 6, what exactly are we supposed to be so sure of that I have a peace and a hope that cannot disappoint? Now, what is the Holy Spirit actually being uh, poured out as a, a guarantee of? Look at verse 6. It says, For when we were still without strength... In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so when and who for did Christ die? What was the condition or, or the status of mankind when God stepped in? Hopeless lost. Were they, were they just 
almost there and I'm going to pull you the, the rest of the way. You guys are pretty good, but I can tell you need a little boost. Now, it said that the words there actually just, just at the right time, right in the nick of time. I mean, you were right at the end when I, when I stepped in, okay? Uh, we were ungodly. We were suppressing him. We were self-righteous. We were rebellious. We were unprofitable. We were uh, those who had no fear uh, of God before our eyes, as we've already read. And he comes down from his high and his lofty position. He comes down into the muck and the mire that we have put ourselves in. And he lifts us up to be seated with princes. I mean, and think about this from a human perspective, right? I mean, let's just be real with yourself. I, I might be willing to help someone who deserves it, right? I might jump in front of and take a bullet for someone who has done some good for me, right? I mean, that person, if I'm going to jump in front of a bullet for you, you better at least be better than me so that when I'm gone, at least, at least some sort of uh, balance has taken place, right? But we are not that person in reference, in relation to Christ. You know, he wasn't taking our, our bullet for us because we were pretty good and he can do it. That just shows the depth and the riches of how much uh, God loves us when he steps in. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And it's important to note that it doesn't say in his own love toward us, God brushed our sins aside. He just, I'll forget about those, no big deal. He says that Christ died for the ungodly. A, a ransom was paid, a price was paid, a dear price was paid. Christ died for us and he took our sins and our punishment at just the right time. Now, the circumstance in which he finds us is extremely important because it gives us yet another truth, and that's laid out starting in verse 9. He says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. All right, so we were enemies with God. We set up our tent in the wrong camp. And God came down and, and crossed enemy lines, and he pulled us back onto his side. And he, he paid our ransom with the most rare and precious thing that has ever walked this earth. And he did all that to reconcile us to God. All right, that, that word reconcile or reconciliation is used three times here in this passage. What, is, what does it mean? What does reconcile mean? What's that? Make right something that was wrong? That's, that's kind of how I, I'm, I'm an accountant, for those of you who don't know, I work in accounting. And so I've got folders on my desktop that say reconciliations. So I want to make sure we kind of, we get this concept because it's that in that, in that sense, it's like, oh, how do I, how do I meld these two together? Right? How do I make this equal this? How do I balance out the scales and reconcile this? How do I make right something that's wrong? But the word reconcile literally means to make friends again. That is the, the definition of the word to make friends again. And in that sense, you can see how that would say, I'm going to make these two things come together. Right? But literally, it means to make friends again, right? We were enemies with God. We did stand in rebellion against God. And then what did he do for us while we were in such a circumstance? He died for us. He laid it all on the line for us. What do you think he, if he did that for his enemies, what do you think he's going to do for his friends? Anything and everything, you can have so much confidence in what has been done for you because you are now friends with God. Um, he endured that, that hard part. He endured that humiliating part when we were in rebellion uh, against him. So shouldn't we have a, a blessed assurance, a peaceful assurance, a hopeful assurance that in the glory of God, there is no fearful expectation of the wrath of God to come? We should have a peace and a hope in the sense that, or in the knowledge that he's done everything to put us in this position. We're going to stay there if we continue in that faith. Paul. Do 
Do I think we see ourselves as enemies with God? I think initially we should. But if we say we, if we, if we, do, if we fully don't comprehend that sin that we're in, I think we could just say we're, we're buddies with God who might, might run into him on occasion, <laughs> right? But the picture that Paul is painting for us is a, is a dire one. You, you had made up your tent. You had set yourself in with the enemy, you know, on the side of, of sin and death. And you stood in, in, in rebellion against God. And you've got to understand it. That's how Paul kicks off his gospel, his good news, is that you are in a bad way. But God loved you enough, even when you were in that bad way, I'm going to pull you out of it. And now we are friends with God. We are no longer his enemy. We are his friends. And that's the position we want to continue ourselves in. And now the scriptural example, right? So he's laid out his point. You, you have the, you have so much to be hopeful for. You have so much to put, uh, to have peace with, with God. Let's go to the book. Let's go to the example. And then he starts in, in verse, verse 12. Therefore, Just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came from or came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous." Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all the blessings that we have, we have talked about, how do we earn them? Bingo. We don't. They are in and they are through Jesus Christ. They are graciously <clears throat> given to us when we lay hold on them through, through faith in him. And without that faith, we are not in Christ. And if we are not in Christ, then we are in Adam. And if we are in Adam, we are subject to the same condemnation and the same outcome that he was. What was, what was that? Death. <clears throat> Specifically here, a, a spiritual death, I think, although physical death is, is certainly a, a representative part of that. But is, is it a spiritual death because God holds sons accountable for the sins of the father and holds the fathers accountable for the sins of the son? What's he say in verse 12? He says, no, because all have sinned. We are certainly like our father in Adam, but I didn't need father Adam's help to put myself in the position that, that I'm in. I, didn't, I can do that all on my own. So Adam is a, is a unifying representative of our individual sinful selves. But with grace, through faith, we do get the right man in our corner. We get the right representative that we want, but certainly the one that we, we do not deserve. So then <clears throat> throughout this section, he goes through and he contrasts this in Adam versus the in Christ and that's the, the first bell if anybody uh, needs to go get kids. He, he offers up these, these, these comparisons between Adam, the type, and Christ, the, the anti-type. And what are, what are some of those? We 
There's a slew of them. But in, in Adam, you know, many died. There is death in Adam. But in Christ, it says much more, right? And that's not, that's not, that's quality, not quantity. The, the much more that he's talking about there, right? And it is the, the grace of God, by contrast, that is, that is given to many. In Adam, the result is, is condemnation, verse 16. In Christ, the result is justification, all right? In Adam, there was one sin which led to death. But in Christ, there are many sins that are, are covered and, and are, we are given life uh, because of them. In verse 17, you see that, that death is reigning, right? Death is in control. No one is escaping it. No one is getting away from this death. But in Christ, you have grace and grace to, to reign in life. Verse 18, you've got judgment to condemnation. And the way the wording is kind of laid out there, it's, it's like wages, like we've talked about. It's, it is what you've earned. It is what you, you deserve in such a situation. <clears throat> but in, in Christ, you're given a gift. And it's a, it is a justification to life. And in verse 19, through Adam's sin entering the world and us following in that example, we are made sinners. Right? We are made not as we should be. But in Christ, we are made righteous. The, the point is that Adam, our father, uh, our representative, he had, how many commands did he have? One command. One man, one command, and 100% failure mode. Gene, you know, you know Six Sigma, right? That'd be pretty bad, right? You had, to, you had, one, you had one man, one law, he broke it. He is a fit representative of, of the rest of us because everyone after that, all of his children have done the exact same thing, right? Adam, through his, his one and his, his first sin, he introduced death into the mix. And it's been in charge ever since because we can't stop acting like our dad. Swings and misses, followed by more swings and more misses. And when we sin, we're sinners, you know, and, and by our works, there is no making that up. There is no making that right once it is messed up. And so our condemnation is just as it should be. It's what we deserve in such a law system. But in a faith system, there is no law because it is not about our meritorious works. And, and Jesus, the, the one man through his one act, introduced life back into the mix. And our sins have been taken and, and borne by him so that we are now guiltless. And we are now justified uh, if we put our faith in that particular act. And we graciously now have life and have been made righteous, made acceptable and, and worthy of standing before God because God faithfully kept his promise and that is righteous and it is as it should be. And now so are we. So to steal from a, a future chapter, to sum, summarize this, this is chapter uh, eight, but to harken back to the first 11 verses here in chapter 5, there is nothing that can separate us from that. If God did what he did for you while you were enemies, no matter how big sin was, you're his friend now. And there's no separation uh, that he would allow to come between that. Um, probably should better, better end it there. All right, well, we'll pick up. Ben's got, uh, he, can, he can wrap this, this up for us there and then talk chapter six because we're talking about how good grace is um, and the fact that when more law came into the system to shed more, more light on it, right? Maybe that's what man needed. Maybe, maybe we just needed a little more direction. Maybe we laid some more rules out, we would get it more and we'd understand it better. But the law came in, verses 20 and 21, to show how bad it really was. More laws didn't fix it. It made it worse and made it appear that much worse. So the grace covers up more sin. But if there's more sin and more grace and grace is a good thing, well, then I should keep sinning. Chapter six. All right. Thank you, guys.